things I should add is if you are interested in being baptized, a part of that service, uh, tonight is the night we need to know. <laughs> so you, you left it to the last minute, um, but tonight's a great night for that. You go out to the connecting point and tell them you're interested. Maybe you just want a little information on that. Um, they would love to talk to you. They have some information that are available to have a conversation about it to see how you can be a part of that baptism service um, next Sunday. That would be, that'd be great. So make sure you tell them if you do want to be a part of that. Well, we're starting a, a series. We're sticking with the home, the, the theme of hope here, but we're starting a new series on relationships. And so we're going to move into this series for a few weeks, and we're going to talk about basically uh, how do we have hope, how do we breathe hope into the relationships around us, how do we receive what we need to receive um, from our Father through forgiveness, through the love of Jesus Christ, and then how do we breathe that out to create healthy relationships around us. So let's just pray as we begin this series together. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to gather with these people tonight. And I just pray that um, you would do your work. You would do your thing by your spirit. You know us. You know what we bring in the room. You know how we come. You know the relationships that we come with that maybe are a concern for us or maybe there's something that we're trying to, to build stronger. But we come here and, and you fully are aware. And then you, we come before your word today and we ask that you would use it to mold and to shape us that we would be able to follow you effectively to bring hope into our relationships. So we look forward to what you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, we have a, a real longing to connect as people. It's just, it's just part of who we are, actually. You see, right in the beginning, uh, when God created Adam, he was up close, he was personal, he breathed life into Adam. And, and if you remember the creation account, uh, if you heard it before, he goes through and he talks about um, creating you know, the land and the, the sea and the animals and the stars and all these wonderful things. And as he goes through creation, he says over and over again, it is good. It was good. It looks good. Man, this looks good. And he gets to man and he's like, this is good. But he sees that man's alone and his comment is, this is not good. It's not good for man to be alone actually. There's something missing. And it's not that he made a mistake. is that he, he planned that as he created man, that he created us, that he created us in need of something more than just our relationship with God. Do you realize that? Like God and man face to face, and yet somehow there's still something there that's needed. And that's relationship. That's how important it is. And so if you've been in Christian circles, if you've gone to church a while, or, um, you've probably heard us say things like, there's a hole inside of us that only God can fill. You know, and so what we tend to do in life, and most people, we try to find satisfaction and fulfillment in life, and people outside of a relationship with God, we cram that full of things, try to be successful, we try to be liked, we try to be loved, we try to, you know, get stuff in cars or houses or climb to the corporate ladder or find relationships that, that satisfy us, and we cram these things because no matter, it seems, where we get to when we stop and we think about our life, we reflect and still have this hole that it's missing, and so it's true that God created a hole in us that only he can fill and satisfy. But what we also see in the creation story that God created another hole. So we got two holes in us that actually only people and relationship can satisfy. And so we have this and we know this. We long to connect with people. And it's something we all, and you know, when we've been hurt, right, and we go through hard times, we'll say things like, you know, I don't need anybody. I'm good on my own, I'm strong, I'm independent, but we know when we're alone and we go to bed, we think about it deep inside, we wish, we long for connection with somebody. That's part of who we were created to be. We were created by relationship, we were created in a relationship, and we were created for relationships. And so this series, I'm excited because 
basically it applies to all of us. You are either, you know, you're either someone's kid or you have kids or you have neighbors or coworkers or you're married. You have relationships. You can't actually function around here very much without having people around you. You are in relationships. You're born into relationship. And so it applies to everybody. And I love doing series where everybody's kind of in the same spot. And that's where we find ourselves today. You know, a lot of research has been done on relationships and the importance of relationships, and they really just validate what Scripture's been telling us all along, which is they're really, really important. And uh, one of the studies I was looking at was done by um, a Harvard social scientist um, where they took 7,000 people and they followed them around for like 10 years. And they, they followed their, their behaviors, their he, eating patterns, their health patterns, and they, they followed their level of commitment within um, community. Did they have solid, fulfilling relationships? And what they found was that people who isolated themselves that didn't have meaningful relations were three times more likely to die than those with strong relational connectedness. That's amazing. Even people they looked at, even people that had bad health habits like smoking, poor eating, they may be obese or used alcohol or even drugs and all these things, even with that, if they had strong social ties, they were healthier than other people. In other words, it is better to eat Twinkies with friends (laughs) than to eat broccoli alone. So the next time a friend calls you up and wants to go for wings or Tim Hortons, you say, yeah, because that's the healthy choice. (laughs) And so they've looked at this and they realize that even for those people that belong to no social group where they find belonging, if they were to join a group where they feel they belong, they can cut their risk of dying over the next year in half. So there's a plug, Jason, for groups. Just use that one. Join a group this fall and you may live. Um, How's that for a slogan? (laughs) Another study, they looked at, they took a group of 300 people and uh, they actually gave them the common cold. And then they cross-referenced people, whether again they were socially connected in loving, caring relationships where they felt satisfied and those that did not. And they, they studied the effect that the cold had on different people, whether they were strongly connected or not. And the people that had strong relational connections did four times better fighting off the cold than those who were more isolated. The people who were connected in good relationships weren't as susceptible to cold and it never really took over their immune system. And they produced significantly less mucus. So, basically, unfriendly people really are snottier. (laughs) Sorry, I'm done on those. I'll just continue on now. So, the problem is relationships are hard, right? Uh, we long for them, we want them, we get hurt by them, we feel vulnerable when we're in them, and yet, we, we, how do we do this? And so we, we struggle in this area. So this series, we're going we're gonna to look at those things. When I was a, a kid, um, I grew up in, in Regina, and I did my time, 10 years, so that's a full sentence. And, uh, but when I was there and I went back to school, my, my mom would take me school shopping, but we always went shopping at the same place. And the place that we went to in Regina, if you ever lived there, you probably heard of this place, called the Sears Clearance Center. And this place is a massive Sears store, except that everything in there has been rejected by someone at some point. So anything that anyone ever sent back for any kind of reason, or if there was some kind of manufacturer flaw, or it just wasn't looking right, or there was chemical flaw, and like the, you know, the dye wasn't set properly, it would all go there. And the thing about shopping there was, yes, the prices were good, and my mom was happy about that, but we knew as kids that something was wrong. And, and you would stare at this item, but they didn't tell you what was wrong. 
It was an as-is department store, which meant, yes, there's something wrong, but it's your job to figure out whether you want it. No refunds, no refunds, no returns, just as-is, you take it. And sure enough, you know, you'd always find when you get home, the zipper that wouldn't zip and the button that wouldn't butt and, and the collar that was crooked or something was wrong. There was a hole, there was a flaw, there was something. When we come to relationships... Most of you didn't realize when you were looking for friends and you were looking for a partner to do life with that you were actually shopping in the Sears Clearance Center, the as-is department. And you did your best. I get it. You're careful about these things. You look hard. You think about it. You study it. But sure enough, sometimes it takes six months, two months, one week. That person turns around and you see it. Finally, the tag, the as-is department is where they came from. You're like, that's why everyone else rejected you and I took you home. But that's, that's just the way it is when it comes to us. I need you to start this series by understanding this about yourself. Because I need you to know that everyone around you is abnormal. Okay? Now, the problem is you're in the same department as they are. You're on the shelf right next to them, which means you're abnormal too. So to begin this series, I think it would be best if we just turn to the person next to us and say, I am not normal. Want to try that out for me? <laughs> Your response to them is obviously this, I knew that already. You see, because deception, the problem with deception is that we don't, you don't know when you're deceived. That's the whole kicker about it. How do you know when you're deceived? Well, you don't, because that means you are deceived. And we think somehow that we are like the epitome of what normal is. I know this about us, because when you drive, for example, anyone that goes slower than you is an idiot, <laughs> right? But anyone that goes faster than you is a maniac. Because you know exactly the right speed in which this situation calls for. Your perception is correct. Your understanding is correct of life. The way you see it, the way you feel, the way you think must be the right way. Because there is no other way than what's inside your own head, right? But you're not. I'm sorry. You're not normal. Um, John Ortberg has this wonderful um, quote that I have from him in one of his books I read. It says, one of the great marks of maturity is to accept the fact that everybody comes as is. In other words, we're all abnormal. And no matter how we see ourselves, it doesn't change this fact whatsoever. So this series on relationships, okay, this series on relationships is based on God's word, but it's not a series where we're going to look at God's word and we're going to try to find, you know, four or five principles to create the perfect relationship so that it's picture perfect and we can set it up on a mantle and we can put it on Facebook and we can show everybody and we can say, look at my kids, or look at my fiance, or look at my spouse. We're not about trying to create a perfect relationship in this series for everyone to see what perfection is. What the series is actually about is, it's about brokenness. It's about how do we deal with that? Because this is actually what's going on, right? We do a lot of things to try to, you know, make it not look that way. We spend a lot of effort on that, right? But the truth is, we know. We know inside that something's not right. <laughs> we know that our relationships are not everything we ever hoped them to be. We know that we're not knocking it out of the park all the time. And we don't really know what to do about it. And so this series is actually, how do you deal with that mess? And how do we get honest and see relationships and see ourselves in a proper way 
so that we can respond and we can get healing and move forward together. Well, where does the brokenness come from? It's a great question. And a lot of people spend a lot of counseling hours and a lot of money trying to figure out the source of their brokenness. Well, we're not going to deal with that. The truth is, brokenness comes from a lot of places, and sometimes it comes from our own decisions. It comes from decisions that we just made. If we were honest, we made some bad decisions and we broke ourselves. Sometimes it comes from the brokenness of other people who damaged us and there was nothing that we did, actually, or we could have done to not be broken by them. But someone else's sinfulness and someone else's behavior broke us and it damaged us. But nevertheless, we're broken. And so we could sit and we could try to figure out who done it or was it intentional, not intentional, but actually, it's still brokenness. And it's your brokenness. And now it's part of who we are. And it's impacting our relationships, whether it was done on purpose or not done on purpose, whether it was you or was it was someone else. We have to figure out how to fix the mess. And so that's what we're gonna do. The Bible talks about a brokenness that's actually part of who we are. <laughs> when, when man was created, put in the garden, and, and it was not good, he was alone, he gave him a woman to do life with, and they were to do life together in a community along with God. And when they rebelled and they didn't listen, they sinned, they, they did what God asked them not to do, they ate of the tree of good and evil, and, and then they, they broke something. The relationship between them and God got broken. And so what happened was God, as usual, would come around and hang out with them. And as he comes to hang out with them, they're aware now, all of a sudden, after they've done what's wrong, they're aware that something's changed in their relationship with him. And so they do something they've never done before. They, they start to hide. And they panic. And they're full of fear. And they, they start to make clothes for themselves to hide their shame and their guilt because they're feeling something they never felt before. That they're broken. That they're, they're not okay for being seen for what they really are. And so they do these crazy things like trying to hide from God. <laughs> we do this too though, right? But what brokenness does is it forces us to start to cover up. I want to look better than I actually am. I want to be seen differently than for who I am. I feel vulnerable. I'm scared. I'm, I'm, I'm naked. And I'm afraid. So our brokenness is about our relationship with God. But immediately, our relationship with God is broken. But what happens is our relationship with each other is broken. So when God calls us up upon um, um, the sin, he says, you know, what's happened here? What did you guys do? I, I love... I, you know, Adam's response, because it's something that I think we do all the time around here. In Genesis chapter 3, God says, so what happened? Adam's like, okay, here's what happened. God, it's your fault. That's what he said. It's, it's that woman, <laughs> the one that you made and you put here with me in the garden, and you made me do life with her. You could have stopped it. You created her. You put her here. She tricked me. She was naked. I fell for it. I ate the food. I tripped and I fell. But really, God, you could have stopped that. It's your fault or it's her fault, but it can't be my fault. Oh, the next thing that happens the very first time in history, blame shifting comes in the door. You know, I, I don't know how I did it, but I think I was just reacting to something. You know, I wouldn't have said that if they hadn't said this. And I wouldn't have had to go there, but they went there. And I didn't plan on saying those things or doing that, but they, put, they left me with no choice. You know, they left me alone. They abandoned. This is why. I did it because they did something. They were broken. They hurt me first, or they set me up. And so, yeah, I'm sure I, I made a mistake, but really, I'm not so sure it's actually my fault. And we see it begin. The next part of history we see laying out in Scripture is the, the sons of Adam and Eve starting to fight and quarrel and jealousy and envy and anger and rage and murder shows up. Brokenness. And the pages of scripture from that point forward are story after story after story of a relational breakdown between God and people and people and people. 
This isn't a book of how to have a perfect relationship. It's actually a story of how to restore brokenness in your relationship with God and how to do life with broken people around you because that is our condition. That's where we come from. And so if you're hoping that you would find somebody who is not broken, Scripture is very clear that that's not going to (laughs) happen. We are all in the same boat. We are broken people. Scripture tells us that God did something about this brokenness on our behalf for us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says that in the midst of our brokenness or our rebellion, our broken relationship with him, our sin, in the midst of our rebellion towards him, in the midst of us not giving a rip about who he was or who we are created to be in our relationship with him, in the midst of all this, God demonstrated that he actually loved us. In the midst of our sinfulness, he demonstrated how much he loved us while we were still rebels and sinning against him. He died for us. And so he is, begins, we hear the, the story of understanding of what God has done to restore the brokenness between us and him. His initiative. Not that we had to clean up or fix ourselves first, that he took initiative to figure out a way in which he could rebuild, bring healing to a broken, broken people. And so he has done that for us. God's perspective on brokenness is actually quite interesting throughout all scripture. We like to hide our brokenness. We like to kind of mask it and pretend we're okay. But scripture says something very different. It says that when we are aware of our brokenness, that God is actually able to move towards us. Isn't that different? Instead of hiding, instead of blame shifting, instead of covering up and pretending that we're not nearly as bad as everyone might think we are. He says, actually, when we know we're broken, he says it all throughout the Psalms, like um, Psalm 34, the Lord comes near to those who have a broken heart. You have a broken heart today? You have a broken relationship? You feel broken, you feel smashed? You're not sure if life actually gonna be any better down the road? Says the Lord comes near to them. Psalm 51 says, God draws near to the broken spirited. Those that just can't get enough in them to actually see hope for the next day. The crushed. He comes near to them. It says in Psalm 147 that he heals the brokenhearted and he begins to bandage their wounds. In fact, we look at Jesus' first sermon when he comes on the scene to announce that the kingdom of God is coming towards people, that the kingdom of God is going to be up close to the people who are going to receive him. And so he talks about how the blessing of God's presence will be near certain types of people. Do you know the types of people he lists in there? They're all broken. The poor, those who mourn, those who are being persecuted, those who have people falsely accuse them of things, those who are humble, those who are crying out for justice in their life because they've been treated unfairly. The people who feel smashed are the people that he comes close to. And we see this. Jesus said, I didn't didn't come to hang out with people who don't think they're broken. I didn't come to hang out with the religious, righteous type people who are all about the system of making sure they look good. I didn't come to hang with them. I came to hang with those people who are sick and they know it. And so everyone was always confused. How could Jesus hang out with such broken people like the prostitute and the robber and the people that he would spend time with and eat with and drink with? Because he said, those are the people that I'm drawn to. The kingdom of God is coming towards those type people. God's presence always comes towards the people who know that they are in need. So, if you come here today and your relationship is more like that than on a pedestal for people to look at. If your heart feels like that, or you've lost a relationship and you feel broken, if you feel smashed today, then you are actually in the perfect place for God to begin to do a great work in you. If you call him in, aware of who you are, the situation you are, you're not masking, 
You stop blame shifting. You stop trying to figure out exactly what went wrong and how it went wrong and who's at fault. If you would just put that all aside and you just say, our relationship, my relationship is smashed. It's broken. I got fragments all over the place. I want you to know you are in a great place for him to begin to do work. That's what scripture consistently tells us. Peter Scazzaro has this uh, great co uh, quote. He, he writes quite a few books on emotional, healthy spirituality. And he says this, the gospel says, so the Bible says, or Jesus says, that you are more sinful and flawed than you ever dare believe. Like you are messed up, okay? <laughs> There's the bad news. Yet, you are more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope. Because Jesus lived and died in your place. The way we enter into relationship with God, there is only one way. It's not in performing. It's not in cleaning ourselves up and, and looking the part. It's coming in on our knees broken, saying, I can't do it. I can't make life work. I can't get relationships to work. I can't even make myself work. I need a savior. That is how you enter into relationship with God. That is the beginning of every starting place for relationships. So this series is about how do we deal with brokenness. Today, we don't get to get into all of those things yet. We just need to start with the fact that we are. Now, we need to deal with it, and so I'm going to ask you, and this is, it's a big ask, but I'm going to ask you to journey along with us in this series. So I'm asking you to come back or follow along online and continue the process, because if you don't, you only get little slivers of the picture today. We can't go through it all, because we actually have to deal with brokenness. So just saying we're broken and we walk out the door is not going to help us, Right? Because broken people break people. See, that's, that's sharp. <laughs> I found out yesterday, by the way, I I'm confessing, I practiced. I wanted to make sure this thing would break. And so I picked up a piece and I cut my thumb, which is, you know, of course, <laughs> that was stupid. But I learned, yeah, brokenness cuts, right? If you've ever hung out with a broken person for very long, you get cut. You get hurt. Something happens. The problem is we realize that every one of us is broken, and so we constantly hurt each other. And so what happens is, you know, regardless of how you were broken or how you got broken, if you don't get healing from that, you're actually going to hurt other people. And so I, no doubt that a, a lot of us have been legitimately hurt. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that you, did, you shouldn't have been hurt. Someone that you should have been able to trust hurt you. See, we should have expectations in our life that people we love will love us. <laughs> uh, people that we're born into relationship with, like our parents, will protect us. They'll, be, they'll get our back. They'll, they'll, they'll be on our side. They won't cheat. They won't lie. The people that we do life with, that we love, the people that we're born into will, will be there for us. They won't abandon us. They won't backstab us. These are the things that are legitimate things we should be able to expect. Should we not? Yes. And so we get broken because the people who, you know, gave birth to you, the people that you do friendship with, the people that you married, they were broken too. And so all of a sudden you're getting hurt by them. So it doesn't matter actually where it came from. The fact is we need to get healed from this because hurt people will continue to hurt people. And so even though you were legitimately hurt and wronged at some point, no doubt, I would believe your story. If you came and told me your story and told me how wronged and hurt you were, I will say, yes. But now it's your brokenness. And if you don't get healing from that, you will begin to hurt the people that you love too. That's the problem. We see this generation after generation. And so I know full-grown adults who are still trying to figure out who's to blame for all their brokenness. We just got to let that go for right now. Because we got to get healing from it. So we don't damage the very people that we're trying to do life with around us. 
So that's where we're going. So hang in there with me. This isn't going to be easy. I want to give you a verse that um, this, seri- this, this sermon really comes down to, which is Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 is, is a chapter on how to do life with people, how to have unity, how to have, get along with people when you're connected in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it says this, the first is a short sentence, and it's just full of meaning, and it's absolutely what we need to do, which is this, be humble and gentle. <laughs> Those are the two things I need you to hear today. Be humble and gentle. When you're gonna do life with people, you're gonna be in relationship with people, you need to be humble and be gentle. Well, what does humble mean? Humble means, it, it, the root word of humility is usually grounded in earth, dirt. In other words, don't think of yourself like dirt, that's where we get it wrong. I think of yourself like dirt. No, humility means I'm grounded in reality of who I am. I know myself. I know my weaknesses, I know my flaws. I know what I've been saved from. I know what I've been forgiven. Humility is a posture of someone who receives grace and mercy. And so humility in our world today is not really one of the top characteristics of, you know, I want to achieve greatness in the corporation world. Well, what's your number one characteristic? Humility. You'd be like, eesh, strength, power, force, vision, leadership, Jesus' quality and all the qualities he wrote scripture about what it looks like to have a biblical, biblical characteristics that God wants. Number one is humble, fully aware of what we've been forgiven from. And gentle because, quite frankly, if you're going to deal with people, you're going to have to be gentle because they're broken. <laughs> no, you can't just go around and say, I, you know what, say whatever I think and do what I feel. And that's the way it is. And if someone doesn't like it, I can just go, you know, you hear this all the time. You're like, I don't think relationships go well for you. Well, I've been hurt, and I don't going to be hurt again, and if I have a problem with someone, I'm just going to tell them the way it is, and if they can't accept me for who I am, yeah, well, no, that, that's not going to go well for you. What if you've ever encountered people like that, and they have a relationship breakdown, a relationship breakdown, a relationship breakdown, and you're thinking, you know, a little humility, a little gentleness probably go a long way. Humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. In other words, the people that you are going to love will have faults. <laughs> there, change your expectations. Right there, it's saying, look, you need to be humble, first of all, aware that you have faults. Aware that you have need of forgiveness and grace and mercy. And you need to be gentle with people because they're cracked and they're broken. And they have faults. And so the way you relate to them needs to be a gentleness, a gentle spirit, an awareness of where you've been. So we don't, you know, have a high value for this, but when you take the word gentle and you take the word humble, you get this word in the middle that Jesus actually used when he talked about blessed are the meek, right? The blessing of God comes towards the meek. And the best picture I can give you of humble and gentle and meekness is this picture I got for you of this horse. Because sometimes we think, well, you're just telling me to be a doormat. Like, I'm just supposed to, you know, let this person do whatever they want. I'm just supposed to be weak. That's weak. I don't want to be weak. I want to be strong. Well, this is a picture of a meek horse, okay? It's not weak. It's strong. Its strength, though, is submitted to the love for the love of another. And so you can see this girl is able to lead this massive, strong horse around because of its love for her, not because it's a control thing, but because it's willing to. It doesn't mean it can't run. It doesn't mean it can't get away. It doesn't mean it can't speak his mind. It means that it chooses not to for the love of another. So because of your love for these people, you choose to submit sometimes when you think you have the right answer you submit to that. You don't need to actually be right all the time. Sometimes you need to be gentle and patient and allow the other person. And so this is the picture I want you to understand. We're not talking about being run over. We're talking about a submission for the love of another. If you want a relationship based on love, then you need to learn how to do this thing called meekness. I want to show you, because Jesus actually 
never asks us to do anything is really important when it comes to this area of relationships. He'll never ask us to do anything in our relationships with one another that he hasn't already demonstrated for us. Okay? He'll never ask you to do anything for anyone else that he has not already done for you. So, being a follower of his, we are called to treat our relationships the way that he actually treats us first. Ephesians, I'm Philippians, sorry, Philippians chapter 2. If you take your Bible in front of you, you can turn there if you want. It's on page 819 or Philippians chapter 2 in your Bible. I want to read this quickly for you. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you receive encouragement from him because of this. <laughs> if you have any comfort from his love. In other words, you receiving his love and grace and mercy. That this comforts you. That you are accepted the way you are. That while you are still sinners, while you are still his enemy, that he died for you. If you receive comfort from him, knowing that you can turn to him at any time and receive grace and mercy, if you receive comfort from that, and if you have share in this spirit, and if you have any tenderness or compassion, then make my joy complete, being like-minded, like-minded of Christ the way that Christ has treated you, having the same love, being the same one in spirit and, one of, and of one mind. He continues, so we don't do anything then out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So we don't think about ourselves. We're not out looking at relationships that benefit just us. <laughs> you know, I'm looking for someone that can meet my needs. I, I see people looking for relationships that way. That's a scary posture to go into looking for relationships. I'm looking for someone that can meet my needs for the rest of my life. Uh-oh. So do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Think of other people as more important than yourself. Not your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And you say, but that's really, really hard. Oh, but he continues to say, but this is why we can ask you to do that. That's such a high calling. Well, we can ask us to do that because in your relationships where I'm asking you to do this, I'm simply asking you to have the same mindset that Christ Jesus had towards you. So I'm not asking you to do anything that you haven't been treated like already. Yeah, he put you first, he says. Jesus had this mindset when it came to you. Although he was in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Can you imagine, I mean, Jesus was actually the only normal person. <laughs> the only unbroken one. So you can imagine him, I can't imagine him because I have a hard enough time knowing, thinking that I, I'm normal but actually knowing you're the normal one. Like you're not flawed. So your thoughts are right. <laughs> your perceptions are correct. The way you see life is the way life should be seen. And you're sitting around campfires for three years with these ragamuffin guys who are talking and yipping and about life and how life works and relationships. And can you imagine being Jesus sitting there through all that, tolerating that? It would drive me nuts. I can't imagine that. Because everything that he, people would say would be absolutely ridiculous. But somehow for him to have a relationship with these people, he actually considered these people higher than himself, worthy of his love. He didn't grasp onto who he was. He didn't take every conversation and go, you guys are idiots. Here's reality. Here's the truth. He didn't beat him over the head every time he could do it. That's what he said. He didn't do that. He didn't grasp onto who he was and make himself something in every circle. He allowed people, sinful, corrupt, wretched people to throw accusations at him, to spit at him, to beat him, and drag him to a cross unjustly for the love of another, you and me. That is incredible, what he was willing to do. So he didn't grasp on this. Rather, he, he made himself nothing, or he emptied himself of what was due him. What was his rights? He took his rights, and he emptied them out. And he said, I'm coming here, and I'm going to take the nature of a servant. And being found in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient 
and led by corrupt, wretched, sinful people to a cross. He is not asking us to do anything that he has not done for us. Here's a special service. I'll just give one little tidbit on this one. I'm going to go try not to waste my time. There's a, a wonderful passage of scripture right before we've heard often about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But you can't skip over right before that. There's a verse right before where he gets up to wash the disciples' feet, and it says this. Jesus was now fully aware of who he was and the authority in which he had. He knew he was God. He knew his rights. He knew the praise that was worth him coming towards him. And so he got up from the table. He poured some water and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, if I knew I had all power and authority <laughs> in a relationship, it, it's, it would, you know, I'm not so sure I'd get up and start washing people's feet as a servant. I'd say, hey, I, I'm really something. You should pay attention to what I say. I'm smart. But Jesus humbled himself for the love of another, for the love of a relationship that he wanted with you and me and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Well, how did Jesus handle this all the time? There's a couple of perspectives that I, I saw. When he looked at the crowds, he saw people different than we see people. He saw them as helpless, he saw them, saw them as harassed. And he was able to have compassion on them because he was fully aware that they were broken people. How many times do, does this happen to you? It happens to me. I see people, you know, and someone gets caught in some scandal or does something, and I think, how could they be so stupid? I would never do that. Why would they do such a dumb thing? They know better. Didn't they know better? Have you ever seen someone that you, you know, why don't, they know better. And we look at them as purposeful. And we look at them as when they hurt us, as they must have thought about that. I think she specifically or he specifically said that. That was out to get me, that person. But Jesus saw the people who were crucifying him. And he said, Father, I want you to forgive these people. They don't even know what they're doing. They're so broken. They don't get it. They don't see me for who I am. They don't know me. I need you to, you can forgive them. Are you kidding me? His perception of people, he saw them for who they were. For us, we, we think the worst. We think people are deliberately out to get us. We need to change. First of all, we need to be humble. We need to understand who we are, what we've been forgiven from, our debt, our brokenness first. We need to breathe in Grace and mercy and hope that we receive first. Before we can go out and do CPR and relationships around us, Jesus, I, I'll talk about this later, I'm sure, but Jesus said, you know, take the log out of your eye. <laughs> Plank, take this log out of your eye. Before you start trying to help someone take a little piece out. Understand your issues. <laughs> Understand your brokenness. Before you even try to fix a relationship around you. Start with you. No matter who's to blame, no matter what happened, what went wrong, start with ourselves. Be humble and gentle, patience with one another, allowing, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. I, it comes down to, as I end, I'll just say, it comes down to expectations. Do you see people as they are, which is broken? Do you give them the benefit of the doubt that, you know, maybe they didn't mean that? Maybe they didn't actually want to say those things. Maybe they're just in a bad mood. Uh, maybe they're just broken. <laughs> they, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know any better. Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. That's what Jesus did. Um, have you ever played hockey? <laughs> I played hockey a few years back. And I'll end with this. Uh, I played in two leagues at the same time. I played in the beer leagues, and I played in the Christian Hockey League. Christian Hockey League is horrible. 
It's horrible. It's nasty. And I, and I, I looked at that for a long time. In fact, it was so bad in Regina, that place I did my time, um, that the refs actually went on strike from the Christian League and refused to ref it for two years. So they had to ref themselves. <laughs> that didn't go any better. What I started realizing was, this is actually not about what the actions were on the ice. You know, you go in the corner, you get bumped, you get slashed, you get hit. You know, someone takes a slap shot, it's a little high, it's not supposed to be, you're supposed to keep it down, you're not supposed to really hit, so you bump in the corner, someone trips and falls. You know, in the beer league, you just kind of be like, well, maybe he's been drinking between periods and just lost his balance. Like, <laughs> he probably doesn't know what he's doing. You know, and it's, it was so much easier to just deal with it. And so in between periods, you know, we would just be having a good time, not because of the beer. I wouldn't do it. But in the Christian locker room, it was crazy. They were angry and mad. And did you see what that guy did to me? He slashed me. Well, you were in the corner. He's probably going for the puck. No, no, no. I know he did that. Do you know what church they go to? Oh, I can't believe that. They call themselves Christians. And it's like this weird expectation thing. It had nothing to do with the behavior. It had everything to do with holding them to this incredible standard of they must know better. They know better. They know the rules. Why would they do that on purpose? And I'm like, I think they're just going for the puck. But this is what happens. It happens in churches. Not better. I know I left that church. They hurt me. Well, they're broken. I'm going to come to this church. Uh-oh, like... We got just a little bit more broken people. Like, there's more of them. They're probably going to get hurt here too. Like, because you hang out for any amount of time and you'll find out that we're all broken. And eventually when you hang around with people, you'll get scraped and bumped and bruised and hurt. And it's not always intentional. It's our stuff. And so we have to be able to see each other differently. First, we look at ourselves. We fix ourselves first. Breathe in grace and mercy. Breathe in an awareness of who we are before we try to breathe out and fix the person we're doing life with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace and mercy in my life. I tell you, if it wasn't for you, <laughs> I would not be here. You have poured out so much. You're so patient. The truth is I do know better so many times. And yet you're patient and you're loving and you're kind, slow to anger and abounding in love. That is who you are. And I've received that. And there's so many of us who have received that from you. And we sing these songs of praise and thankfulness. And then we go out the door and we hold people accountable to a whole different standard than we receive. Heavenly Father, would you help us today to be humble? to be aware of what it truly meant for you to die on the cross for us. What it cost you for our love. Then Heavenly Father, would we go out and would we do life with people differently? With humility and gentleness and patience, making allowances for people's faults. So that in such a way, I pray, in such a way that the people that haven't yet experienced grace from you, there's so many people that they're still got that hole and they have not experienced grace and mercy, but they would experience us at work or us in the neighborhood or us in the marriage, us in the family. They would experience us and they would take note that there's something different. There's hope in us. There's grace. There's mercy for them when they're around us. That there's a different standard because we are humble people. I pray that others would notice who you are because of how we love. That's what you've said. People will know that we are your disciples by the way that we love. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.